it feels good to be recording again because sometimes you kind of get out of sync or out of touch with what God has called you to do and you kind of need to get back to the basics, you know, back to those things that were inspiring to you in the first place. You know, your personal relationship with God because that is, after all, what Jesus came to do. He came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Now, a lot of people tend to take this abundant life and make it into the word prosperous, so they think of it as being like, well, now that I'm a Christian, you know, I'm going to get all this wealth and health and happiness stuff. But they don't really read what Jesus said. Jesus himself, when he came, he said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly in this world as well as eternal life to come. But he said that he came to establish you a relationship with his Father in heaven. That his Father in heaven so loved you that he wanted you to know him the same way that Jesus knew him. And so Jesus came to explain things in a better way that we seem not to have understood in the Old Testament way, so to speak. Because he sent us prophets and teachers and judges and kings and priests and all kinds of ways to learn. But unfortunately, by the time Jesus arrived, we still hadn't gotten the message quite right. We had deteriorated into kind of a legalistic form of theology. Quite similar to what we're doing nowadays is that we really understand what grace is, but we seem to want to throw it back to doing our own thing in some ways. So you see on the one hand, the Jewish nation as an example of believers failing God and needing to find from God himself, his own son, the right way to know and to understand the word of God as well as to have a relationship with him. And in modern days, you find the Christian likewise going off on a tangent, not having that personal relationship where they actually hear God speak because they're so busy looking at what God said, they don't ask what God is saying. In other words, Jesus said, I do those things that are pleasing to my father. I want you to know him personally. I will leave you so that you can have the Holy Spirit that God may speak directly to you and you may speak directly to him. God knew in the fullness of time from Genesis all the way to Revelation that we would not get it. We wouldn't understand, we wouldn't comprehend. That we would know in part and we would see in part. But until the fullness of time was accomplished, that the entire revelation of his own son, Jesus, was made manifest to us. We really wouldn't understand the Old Testament and the New Testament, even when we have both of them. Because we would still, in some ways, seek to serve ourselves rather than serve the Lord. Because that's really what we were created to be. We were created for God's good pleasure in order to have fellowship with him. Not the kind of fellowship that, you know, we make up in religious circles, you know, where we have this kind of like, oh, well, we all get together and watch a football game. Oh, we all get together on a Sunday and have a worship service. Oh, we all get together, you know, on a Bible study and have a Bible study. Fellowship for God was a oneness with knowing God our Father the way that Jesus knew his Father in heaven. There was a unity, a completeness, a automatic knowledge that they could speak to each other of what God wanted done and it was done because even as you read in Genesis and God said let there be light and it was so we as Americans especially in this society we live in have this tendency of wanting to assert ourselves we don't want thy will be done as much as we want thy will to reflect my will we want our will to be the will of the people to accomplish what we say is God's will because it is written and you know, every time somebody tells me what's the Bible say, I always am immediately taken to what Jesus did with his own people that he came to share the word of God with. He said, you have heard it said, or you know it is written. And then he adds something after that, but I say unto you. Now, I always have to do that in modern times, which is interesting to me because... I want to know what Jesus says to you today and how do you interpret it because that's what Jesus did to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler came to him one day and says, you know, I know the scriptures. You know, he says, I understand them. He says, 
what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he knew that there was such a thing as eternal life. He knew what the Word of God said. He even knew, probably, pretty close in some ways, who Jesus was. So Jesus said in the scriptures, as it was recorded of him, he loved him. He said he saw him and he loved him. But he said to him, what do the scriptures say and how do you interpret them? Because you see, there's a reason why Jesus would say, how do you interpret them? Because we're all going to stand before God alone. We're going to be judged according to how we judge. We will give an accounting to God for what we know, not what we don't know. So even in when we think that we, uh, quote unquote, have this idea of judgment down, Really, Jesus said, judge not, for with what measure you judge, you shall be judged. Because in reality, we are going to give an accounting for how we judge to the Lord our God. And he gave us kind of a warning of that with the rich young ruler, because he says, how do you interpret the scriptures? And, you know, what is the greatest? He says, well, hear, O Israel, Lord our God, the Lord is one, and I shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you know, and, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, you're right. He says, by golly, you've got it. He says, now you only lack one thing. And the rich young ruler goes, really? Cool. You know, I figured I had it because, you know, I kind of did studying all these years, you know, and with all the money and all the prosperity that I've had, I've, I've used it in such a way that I have great knowledge and great wisdom. So he says, you're right, you do. Sell all you have and come follow me. <gasps> oh, the reality of God came home to this rich young ruler. The reality of not taking just what was written or just what was interpreted came suddenly home because there was nothing wrong with this rich young ruler. You see, it was time to put into place the practices or the reality of living out your faith according to what already is written and what already is done and what already has been said. Because that's what Jesus had to do. Jesus came not to do his own will, but the will of his Father who sent him. You were created to the will, to do the will of your father, whoever that may be. You see, Jesus said, you can determine whose father you are by what you do. If you're doing the works of the flesh and the things of the flesh, then you are of your father, the devil, who is of the flesh, who created sin. In reality, well, he didn't create sin, but he brought sin into existence, the corruption of sin into the existence of mankind and tempted Eve in a way that she was able to think that she could determine for herself a course of direction without asking God, much like we do today. She thought to herself, she reasoned within herself, and she decided by herself what to do. And God never wanted her to. God said, ask me. God said, don't do this. And yet, she figured out for herself what to do and brought sin into the world. And likewise, Adam, knowing full well what she had done, participated in rebellion by choosing to seek to follow Eve in what she had done. Now, we in our modern days do that often every day. We act like Adam and Eve by choosing to do what we want to do. We reason in ourselves. We say, well, I know the scriptures. This is what God said. This is what the Bible has written. This is what the Word of God wrote or what the children of Israel did. This is what my pastor taught me. This is how my religion goes. This is what I believe by faith. It's funny because, you know, I always hear those statements regularly every day. As a matter of fact, I deal with people that say them to me over and over again. Well, systematic theology teaches this, you know, that we should do this and we should act like this and we should become like this and our dogma and our doctrine and our, our, our uh, hermeneutic and homiletic is assured, you know, because after all, we, we've studied these things. And it's the same thing that the Jews said till Jesus came. And he said, but I say unto you. Jesus made an interesting statement to those that were listening at the time of his departure. He could look out over the ages and see what was going to happen at the end of the age, the age that we live in. He said, when the Son of Man returns in all his glory, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith? And the interesting thing is, what he meant is being interpreted by people to say, well, of course I got faith. I got faith to believe that I can get from God what I demand from God. 
I have faith to believe that I can tell God what to do. I have faith to believe that I can be healed if I want it. You know, faith they're using instead of really understanding they're abusing something that God never said. Because what Jesus meant, well, when he said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? It was faith in his Father as Jesus described him. Because Jesus had already said, look, you know what's written, but I say unto you. And then now we interpret what Jesus said as something else. Like his sayings don't mean what they mean. They have to be taken as kind of a generic overview of you know what the kingdom will be like by and by. Except for one problem. When you look at what Jesus said and you look at the end of his sayings, he says, I will liken a man who does these things as, and he tells the story of a foolish man and a wise man. So we are not given the opportunity to deny what Jesus said. As a matter of fact, Christianity was always defined as Christ-likeness. Christianity, the word itself, means becoming like Christ, like the one who was crucified, being as crucified to our selfish desires as the Christ was. And it was used as a slur because, you see, the Christians would not resist evil. They would not fight back against the Roman dictators and occupiers. As a matter of fact, they rejoiced in losing their lives unto death so that they could be a witness unto God of their faith in Him, even unto death. For their testimony was sure, and it was recorded for us, even in the Book of Martyrs, Fox's Book of Martyrs. But today we have a different kind of Christianity being portrayed. It doesn't require much for us to do because we say that it's all been done for us by grace. God has always accomplished for us what we need not worry about doing. We just have to accept the salvation and then go be blessed and then give the blessings to God when we die. Or is it what Jesus said to do? Because the rich young ruler found it very challenging in talking to God. And you should be challenged likewise when you are dealing with a living God as opposed to a dead idea of who God is. Because it's easy to read about the God of the Old Testament. It's easy to read about the God of the New Testament. It's a whole other matter to realize the living God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That from Genesis to Revelation, He has declared His Word. He has declared that wrath of God is coming. He has declared that judgments of God are coming. He has declared that he is going to pour out his anger upon the world. And it's coming soon. So when we teach grace and we teach about all these other things of theology, we seem to gloss it over with this smooth icing that we want to put over a cake that's as hard as a rock because it doesn't have the substance of one person in it. Jesus. You see, Jesus came because we didn't understand, though we thought we did. And that was 2,000 years ago. Jesus comes to people today, even as he did in the Jesus movement, and explains it to them by simply saying, read it. You don't need anything else for your understanding of what God said. You don't need anything else to understand if God will speak to you today. Jesus said that, as a matter of fact, if you want to know whether or not you're one of my sheep, all you need to do is ask yourself, are you hearing my voice? Because Jesus didn't say, my sheep read my voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. As a matter of fact, he made a very clear and very blunt, oh, I'm calling everyone. God so loved the world that the entire world should not perish but have everlasting life. Though it should not perish, it will. Because there are many that are called, but there are few that are chosen. Because not everyone's going to respond. And once they do hear the word, then like the seed that was told, we're told that God would see their circumstances of life and they would decide that the world was much more than what they wanted from Christianity. So they would go after the world and try to somehow compromise the two. And the weeds of the world and the world in its ways would choke out the word of God from their lives. Because the word of God, if you want to find out the purity of it, it's very simple. Go back to Matthew. Go back to reading what Jesus said. Or better yet, go to the book of Revelation, which is really scary. 
and then read just the letters to the seven churches because you fit into one of those churches. That's what Jesus said, and that's what Jesus is saying to you. We're told to watch and be ready because we know not the day or the hour when the Son of Man returns. And the reality of that is that any day the Son of Man may come and require of you your life. Jesus told a parable about a rich rich farmer who, you know, he he harvested and got all kinds of harvest in and he was prosperous and he made a lot of money. And he says, you know, I, I did pretty good this year in the harvest. You know, I think what I'll do is that next year, I think I'll go ahead and invest in the stock market. You know, I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to build a bigger church. I'm going to have a mega church. I'm going to have a mega ministry. And next year, I'm going to have a mega oh, outreach. And you know what happened? Jesus said, that night the man died and the Lord came to him and said, Thou fool! This night the Lord requires of you your soul. No man knows the day or the hour very simply because you don't know what day or hour you will die. Oh, we're told when the rapture will be. That's pretty easy to figure out. It doesn't take a genius to sit down and start to compare the signs of the times, which is a general idea of when it will be. That will tell you kind of like years more or less, which is what the pastors like to teach you right now about, oh, it'll be soon in the by and by. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. But then if you get beyond the signs of the times and you start getting into the feasts of the Lord and you start studying a little more and read what Jesus said, you kind of start getting into, oh, like the days of Noah and Lot, you know, kind of like, you know, violence and more violence and, you know, like wars and rumors of wars and you start looking for all these different signs and wonders and you start going, whoa, it looks like it's kind of getting closer. Then you realize that, well, the prophets did tell us when Israel became a nation, how soon it would be. And then Jesus gets even more specific when he starts talking about the wedding feast. So you really can find out things like the rapture. But you know what's interesting is that people use the rapture as an excuse and a scapegoat. They like to teach themselves, oh, well, I'm going to get out of it, so I'm going to go do what I want to do in the meantime. After all, we need to occupy, so let's be preoccupied with the world. After all, God's going to reward us according to what we did for him. In Jesus' name, I've done it. I've raised up the dead in Jesus' name. I've, you know, done all these marvelous works in Jesus' name. And the interesting thing is that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Who asked you? You did all these things in my name, but did you do what I said to do? And you see, that's the problem that we run into in this year, the new year. We get all kinds of messages by people telling us all kinds of good feelings, you know. We want to make you feel good. We want you to look forward to the years with hope and excitement about, oh boy, it's going to get better and better and better. No, it's not. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. The biggest lie I hear every year on New Year's Eve, except when you go to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and you listen to the prophecy update on New Year's Eve, which is what I used to love to go to, but unless you're really paying attention, most Christian ministries are telling you either one of two things at New Year's Eve. Pay the rest of your money that you promised you'd give us last year, and we're in debt now because you promised, and we made, we made our budget based upon what you promised you'd give us, and so they always hit you up at the end of the year, right around Christmas time, you know, when you spend all your money. Oh, don't forget, you promised. Now, you know, God's going to bless you this new year if you don't go ahead and pay up what you promised you'd pay last year. Or... You hear, oh, be blessed in the new year. God's going to reward you with everything you've ever dreamed of and wanted. After all, it's an abundant, prosperous life he's giving you. I don't hear on New Year's Eve, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, freely receive, freely give. I've never heard that on a New Year's Eve message. Not even from Leonard Ravenhill or David Wilkerson, some of the guys that, you know, are treated as hellfire and brimstone or at least some kind of serious gospel messages. And I've often wondered why. And I know why, because we really treat the end of the year as though we're going to do something new in the new year. We're going to resolve to be better, and we won't. We're going to resolve to be closer to God, and you won't. As a matter of fact, the one thing that Jesus said about the end of the age was that he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. Matter of fact, he who is a murderer, let him be a murderer still. He who is evil, let him be evil still. And he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. Because it's not about resolving to do better. 
It's not even about repentance anymore. What it is about is the reality of dealing with the living God. Because one way or another, you will. Moses had an interesting predicament. You see, he had a people that God said, hey, I want you to go deliver him. So he says, okay, I will. And he goes down and kills somebody. And God says, that's not the way I told you to do it. So Moses runs for his life. And later, God sends him down again. Now, Moses was a murderer. Moses had the wrong idea about how God delivers people. And it's not by violence, ever. But, you see, God wants to reveal himself when he's delivering people. He doesn't want you to reveal yourself. There's nothing marvelous about Moses. Moses, we're told, was a stutterer. Now, whether he stuttered or had a speech impediment or whatever, we're not positive, but we're pretty sure. So, he was a humble man. And it says, according to the scriptures, he was humble above all men. Now, that's pretty humble. Huh. It's amazing to me. So I'm not quite sure what kind of you know, idea we got from Cecil B. DeMille, but the Bible says the opposite, which is normal for Hollywood. But Moses had a predicament. You see, he brings out the people, God delivers them and does all the miracles and saves them because Moses had nothing to do with it, but God did it all. And every time that Moses had a problem, he asked God to do it and God took care of it, which is what we're supposed to live by. But the interesting thing is Moses had a problem. These people were so wrapped up in the world, they become like the world of Egypt. They were more Egyptian than they were Jewish because they had been 400 years down in Egypt. They had been there forever, it seemed like. Now imagine America twice as bad as it is today. I mean, 200 years more in the future. Imagine what that would be like democracy running amok for 200 more years? I don't think so, but you would not see what you see today as being, you know, like not so bad or so bad as you think it is. No, it was horrible for Moses. He had people that were tearing at each other. They couldn't keep each other together, and I don't care what you think about Jewish, you know, holding out of not being absorbed into, you know, the culture of the times. Back then, they were absorbed, because guess what happened as soon as they got to the mountaintop? Moses goes up, Aaron goes down, and the people come up to Aaron and says, Hey, we're tired of this. We want a party. And so they did. They had orgies and drunken orgies and all kinds of garbage. Because they were used to it. That's what they did in Egypt. That's what we do in the world. As soon as God lets go and steps back a little bit, what happens when men get together in order to have, quote, unquote, a Bible study, and then they jump on their Harleys and start heading out? How many speeding tickets are there? How many, how many of those things that aren't a Christian witness do men actually do when they have men's Bible studies? I know, because I've gone to lots of them. I've been to lots of Christian functions where I wondered, where did the Christians go? You know, Chuck Smith had an interesting Bible study one time up at uh, Arrowhead. And uh, it was a morning devotion only, and he said, you know, you come up here with all your fancy cars and your Harleys. He didn't say Harley at the time, but it would have been Harleys, because back then it was Corvettes. But he would have said Harleys. You come up here in your Harleys and your Porsches, you know, and then you bring up all the Christians, you know, and you want them to get an example of what a Christian's like, and yet you drive up all these fancy cars and you just show them the exact opposite of what a Christian really is. Because Chuck wasn't driving one of those expensive cars at the time. So, immediately the next day, of course, everybody's car disappeared, you know, it was gone. But I still remember that tape, because I was there when he did it, and I remember the tape being checked out a lot. Nowadays, we don't hear that so much because, after all, every Calvary pastor has a Harley. As a matter of fact, every born-again Christian has a Harley, don't they? Or do they? You see, it's a fad, not a prayerful thing to seek after if God wanted you to have a Harley to be like the world. And that's what Moses' problem was when he was dealing with the children of Israel. They become more like the world and were worldly Jewish Egyptians than... Egyptian really like difference of Jews from Egyptians. Guess what? God dealt with it pretty severely. And so Moses comes down from the mountain after God warns him, look, I'm going to wipe all those guys out because they suck. They don't get it. They don't understand what I'm doing. They're not holy. Oh, they're worshiping me. Yeah, they start off by saying they're going to worship me and then they come and they party with a golden calf and do it their way with Aaron. Moses comes down and says, hey, you choose. He says, look, whoever's on the Lord's side, you come over here. You stand over here. The rest of you, if you want to go on with you know, what you're doing, go over on that side. But you choose. You get to decide which way you're going to be. Go to the left or go to the right. Get right or get left. 
So the ones that went on the left, you know, and we're not saying, you know, like left, you know, politics or anything. Who cares? The point is, in the scriptures, you've read it and you know it. You know what it says. Those that went on the left, the earth opened up, poof, God wiped them out instantly. Because God had told Moses, I'd wipe them all out and start with you all over again. And Moses says, don't do it. Because he interceded for them. He alone stood up and saved the Jewish nation. People forget to teach about that. One man saved the Jewish nation, Moses. That's kind of why Moses is coming back at the end of days. Because he'll be testifying against this nation that everybody says, oh, by the way, we need to support the Jewish nation. After all, you know, we are Christians, so we automatically 100% support Israel. I don't. Moses didn't. Guess what? <laughs> Israel today does not look like it's doing what God said. So I'm sorry. I'm not there. So Moses deals with them by saying, God, you decide. And God says, tell them to go to the left and the right. So God takes care of it. So then Moses goes back up and brings down what he says are the commandments of God in order to live a life that would benefit them. Now the children of Israel say, we'll follow it. We'll do it. We swear up and down we will. And you know what? They didn't. Later, Joshua, who had actually gone up partway up the mountain with Moses, he's now, after Moses can't go into the land because Moses blows it, he's in charge of the children of Israel. And he said, look, I'm deciding for you what you're going to do. You choose. If you're going to choose the Lord, then you need to say so. You need to decide for yourselves what you're going to do. Because I've had it. I've seen you in Egypt. I've been with you in the desert. I've been with you when I went into the promised land. I told you what was in there. But now we're getting ready to go in and take it. We're getting ready to get busy with God. We're getting ready to do the reality of what God said to do. So I know what I'm going to do. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to do it His way, even though He blows it later. But He says, I know you're going to say you will, but you won't. So you need to choose today what you will do, even though you won't do it. Because I've lived long enough to know you won't do it even though you say it. And you know, it's interesting. Joshua was right. Sure enough, didn't take very long before they weren't doing what God said. And you know, Jesus comes to us, saves us, gives us salvation, gives us a personal relationship with God, helps us by giving us His Holy Spirit so that we can not go to a church we don't like, but find a church we do like, and even not go to church if you don't like, because you can just read the Word and have a church. But the point is, he's given you everything. And then he comes to his disciples and he says, You call me Lord, Lord, great. I'm thrilled. I'm excited. I'm ecstatic that you call me Lord. Well, why don't you do the things I said? You see, it's still about what Jesus said. It's still about what God is saying to you. I won't be there when you stand before God. As a matter of fact, I kind of look at my own salvation with fear and trembling and I stand before a holy God and worry about, hey, I'm more concerned about what will happen after I die about he who could dim my soul to hell than I'm concerned about what's going to go on in this life. Who cares? Huh. That's going to go up and down and sideways and I can already predict what every man's going to do. It's pretty easy. They do it over and over and over again. We call it history. It repeats itself over and over and over again. Even the scriptures tell us how men will act. But Jesus said something interesting. I say unto you, in this new year, you need to challenge yourself. What is Jesus saying to you every day? Really, because every day that's what you're going to have to deal with. Today, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation, as the Bible says, as God has said, as his prophets declare. Even Jesus used that very much warning. Don't harden your heart. Don't ignore when the Spirit of God is trying to speak to you what Jesus said, because that's what he was sent here to do. He was sent to remind us what Jesus said. Because we're too busy and easily getting distracted by every other thing of what the Bible says, what the pastor says, what the church says, what Christianity teaches, what our systematic theology is, that I finally rejected all of it. And I said, you know what, Lord? I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what anybody else says. Jesus. I care what you say today. Talk to me. And you know what? The biggest shock of my life was it sucked because he did. And you know, <laughs> I could have got away with murder, literally, because the Bible gives you some certain ways of getting away with murder, typically. 
oh, you know, there are certain things in the scriptures that say, oh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You don't have to love your enemies. You have to defend yourself, you know, defend your family just in case somebody breaks in your house. You better have a gun. After all, that's what modern Christianity is. Have a gun, have a tuba, you know, or have a missile launcher, or have whatever else you think you need to protect yourself because God can't do it. He didn't do it in the Old Testament. Can't do it in the New Testament. After all, Jesus died, so guess what happened to him? Huh. Is that kind of protection? So you see, the reality of what people say is always less than what God will speak to you. I can only answer for what God will tell me to do today. I can't answer for what God may tell you to do. But you can. You know, you can today speak with God direct. You today can hear His voice. You today can do the things Jesus said and the things Jesus might say to you, even though most people don't want to hear what Jesus has to say, because the truth is, if you're as honest with it as I am, you already know what Jesus said, because Christianity has always been portrayed as that. Love your enemies, and you sure as hell don't want to do that. You don't want to love your enemies because you're having a hard time loving your friends. You're having a hard time loving your spouses or your relationships that you have, which are supposed to be practice sessions for you before you even get to what Jesus said. Because after all, we're divorcing left and right. We're getting rid of inconvenient kids. We're passing them off to someone else to make the decisions for us. We're not doing what God said to do with children that are supposed to be a blessing to us. We're treating them as a curse. So the reality of your year that you're looking forward to is presented to you today as a blessing and a curse. As I told someone earlier when I was writing, I present to you a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you do it. A curse if you don't. Do what Jesus says. As a matter of fact, this ministry has always been based upon one simple principle. And that was, whatsoever the Lord God tells you to do, that you should do. If you tell me God told you, I'll back you up 100% and stand back and wait and see what God will do. Because you know what? I don't have a problem. You come to me and tell me God said, I'll let you deal with that in eternity. In the meantime, I might not go with you, but I will agree that if you say God said, then I will speak for your behalf and say, yes, he said God said. It doesn't mean that I may agree with it, but whatever God tells me to do, likewise I'll do. And that's why in Vidivo we talk so much about Jesus, because Jesus said that we should know his voice. We should hear his voice. We should do as he said. Because anything else, or anything less, is going to be a curse unto you. Because when we stand before the judgment seat, Jesus will ask you, did you do the things I said? And as we know in the Sermon on the Mount, if you didn't, then he'll say to you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you.